Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, put some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the crystal clear best movie news show <laughs> in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark. On today's episode, Han Solo gets an acting coach, Jackie Chan gets revenge, and a Ben Affleck action movie gets a sequel. Don't hold your breath, Reindeer Games. Ashley, who's joining us? I'll do Ken Napsock. Hey, guys. I'm glad to be here. I was hiking in the Redwoods all weekend, so I'm at peace. Uh, you're not going to get a grumpy Ken today. <laughs> Just kidding. I hate everything. <laughs> I'll see you John Roca. Hello, everyone. I was at WWE Raw last night. I had a great time, so I got a lot of energy carried over for this morning. Ewoks versus wrestlers. Let's see who wins. <laughs> Ashley, what's our first topic today? Yet another report from THR has shined some light on more problems behind the scenes of the young Han Solo movie. The report notes that when production moved from London to the Canary Islands back in May, original editor Chris Dickens was replaced with Oscar-winning editor Pietro Scalia, who works frequently with Ridley Scott. Lucasfilm was also reportedly not entirely satisfied with the performance by Alden Ehrenreich, so they hired an acting coach to come in and work with with him. Further, THR details that it was clear Lord and Miller would not be changing their improvisational style, resulting in less options in the editing room in terms of coverage. Ron Howard has now taken over directing duties, reporting to set yesterday to begin directing reshoots and additional photography that will reportedly push the production well into September. As of now, the movie is still scheduled for release on May 25, 2018. Mark, what do you think of these new details about the Young Han Solo movie? Ashley, unfortunately, this seems like a seven layer dip that we're at about <laughs> layer three right now <laughs> where we just keep unearthing new details about this doom production and as ashley mentioned it is still on pace or at least they're saying it's still on pace for a release that is less than a year away i don't know if they're going to hit that date we even speculated before any of this trouble emerged whether they might want to move off the may date and go back to december because that seems to be doing well for new star wars movies thus far i it, the biggest thing to me is the acting coach coming in because if you need an acting coach this late in the game to steer somebody's performance differently, is that because Lord and Miller were directing this guy to be too wacky and too zany and too weird Al? Or is it because Aaron Reich himself just wasn't giving the performance that Lucasfilm wanted? Now, we heard reports last week that it was actually – Alden Ehrenreich coming to Lucasfilm and saying, hey, I'm not sure that this is the Han Solo that you guys want. Let's all take a look at the dailies together. So that is scary enough. And then when you also have the editor leaving and coming back, I'm not sure what to make of that because they weren't that far into the post-production process yet. It might just be an editor that Lucasfilm was more comfortable with because Ken... Clearly what we're getting from this last week of stories is that Lucasfilm is tightening their grip on this project. They wanted to take a risk. They wanted to go for a comedic element with Lord and Miller. That did not pay off. What do you think about these new details coming in? Are you more panicked about this than you were last week? Uh, I, first of all, I think this is becoming probably the best ESPN 30 for 30 <laughs> we're ever going to get. What if I told you Han Solo was an improv actor? Uh, I, I'm not worried, Mark. I'm not worried. You know why I'm not worried? Because they corrected the problem, whatever the problem might have been behind closed doors. Like we said last week, John, we don't really know. Yeah. We're hearing all this stuff. So what site do you trust? What story do you trust? I heard some other stuff this weekend from people who knew someone who knew someone. I, I, I'm not going to say them because they're pointless because we don't know. We weren't there. But I'm not worried, Mark. It's going to be a great story. But I'm not worried because Kathleen Kennedy did what Kathleen Kennedy needed to do. If she as a boss felt there was a problem, she decided to make a command decision and let's write the ship. Ron Howard is tied into Lucasfilm. Willow, uh, American Graffiti, which, you know, essentially uh, we have Star Wars because American Graffiti was a success with him at the lead with a little uh, Harrison Ford uh, backup role. This is bringing it into the family. As Chris Berman used to say about the Buffalo Bills, they're great at circling the wagons. <laughs> and this is what Lucasfilm has done. And I, I, I'm curious. This is going to be a great story. I said last week, our friend Chris Taylor, start writing this book. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not paranoid because they got this. 
Now, look, we do have a, a recent example of Lucasfilm being able to come in and say, ah, oh, we're not crazy about how this project is going, so we want to change some things. And that was Rogue One, where they came in and did reshoots and changed a lot of the movie, but mm -hmm. it still ended up being a movie that played out when we saw it in December mm -hmm. as something, that, at least in my opinion, was a fantastic Star Wars film. Mm -hmm. Roka, are we going to get the same results, or is this too much smoke, and do we need to burn the house down? I you know this is the first time that I've started to look at the plot in the cemetery for this movie. Like, I'm worried. Like legitimately worried now because this stuff is coming out at such a rapid pace. And it's all, once again, I said this last week, it's a breakup. It's a breakup. So people are coming out and everyone's trying to cover their ass. And no one's telling like what really happened in the relationship. Events are being viewed through two different pr uh, perspectives. So it's just, you hear in Lord Miller's improvisational style. Well, it seemed to work for all these other films. Why doesn't it work for Star Wars? Kathleen Kennedy is having issue with how they fold their socks. Kathleen Kennedy was having those stuff. They're bringing an acting coach now. Alden Ehrenreich, which, which at first last week was like, oh, he's feeling himself. He's he cares about the characters. Got stones. No, it was the fact that he couldn't do a damn thing that was worth it for uh, Lucasfilm to have faith in him to portray this character. So everyone is covering their ass and moving around this whole thing. And so I think you're right. Uh, what you said, Mark. We're at layer three of this seven layer dip. And Ken, I think you're also right too. Like my favorite wrestler, Sasha Banks, like a boss. Kathleen Kennedy handled it and went down and had to take care of it. Now, people said in this uh, uh, this uh, Hollywood Reporter article, she would have been damned if she didn't and damned if she did. So they, it's a it's an uncomfortable position. That's part of being a boss, though. Is like mm -hmm. sometimes you got to make the moves that you got to make to to make sure you save this. And you're right, Rogue One was saved, but there's a lot of us that saw the difference in between the trailers, the initial trailers that portended a darker film with a harder edge Jin Erso and Jin Erso and what happened afterwards, which was a softer edge, more more touchy feely, more mainstream. And so this is what's confusing to those of us who are Star Wars fans. We were told we were gonna get Star Wars stories that weren't necessarily like the trilogy, but there seemed they seem to not want to necessarily go all the way out and trust these directors enough because Gilroy apparently reshot 60% of the movie. That's the rumor and that's insane yeah, but so, rogue one was still a pretty dark movie like like it's not like yes. jen ursa was holding hands with mickey mouse in the final cut it's like she was waking <laughs> up and having a bunch of animals from the forest help her get dressed i True. mean there was a lot of sadness at the end of rogue one and with the han solo movie it like rogue one is a tonally they might have wanted to change the movie yeah. a little bit and alter some scenes maybe mm. put in more darth vader but with the Han Solo movie, Ken, my biggest question is, why is it so late in the game yeah. that you decide to make these changes? I mean, we've been shooting since January. Do you yeah. not go in and watch dailies as a producer, as the head of all of this? Do you not go in and say, oh, maybe we need to do this or we need to twist that? There's some reports that are saying that what they actually had was Lord and Miller, and they just tried to tighten the mm -hmm. reins a little bit and say, hey, you guys need to stick to shooting the script. And so Lord and Miller acquiesced to those demands. But then after they got a a couple takes of the script they would start improvising and that they weren't using as many different angles so it was making it trickier for the editors to be able to cut together the movie that they thought they wanted yep. do you think that we still get han solo released on may 25th 2018 if i if i was a betting man and i do play the game of throne slots that's about it <laughs> um i would say no this gets pushed back but you know we'll see what ron howard and his team and the crew how they react to that uh, you know, as far as late in the game, that may be the biggest concern I have. But yeah. also, uh, as someone in another line, line of duty, another life was a boss for 12 years, sometimes you just let your employees figure it out. Mm. Sometimes you're, you're hearing things. All right, Larry Kasdan, you're an old grump. I get it. They're young and they don't <laughs> fold their socks right. Um, and then maybe eventually you go, wait, I have to step down here and see what's going on. Yep, you're right. I side with this. I side with our lead actor. Mm -hmm. I side with Lawrence Kasdan, the man who brought a lot of life to Han Solo. Uh, George, of course, created him, but I think Kasdan's responsible for a lot of that. But again, you know, this goes back. Kasdan is famously against the Harrison, Harrison Ford's changes mm -hmm. in Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's like, all right, I get it. You're, you, you old grumpy man, go watch the big chill again and 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 then finally late in the game like this is enough and if 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 there weren't backing off as directors their style and didn't want to play ball and again i, I we don't yeah. know yeah. but they seem to least exited gracefully i mean arguably the best line that hanso ever delivered was written by Harrison Ford. Yeah. When yeah. he's, you know, she says, I love you. And he says, I know. It's like he improvised that. So, right. but I give all the credit in the world to Lawrence Kasdan, not just for what he wrote with the original trilogy, but with Force Awakens. That was not Harrison Ford coming back mm -hmm. and being on camera just for a paycheck. That was Han Solo again. And a big reason why is because of the words that we got from Kasdan. So, Roka, yeah. let me spin it forward to you a little yeah. bit. Do you think that we will get it released on May 25th? 
or would you prefer to be pushed? I'd rather be pushed if they're going to get it right. That's my thing. I don't care about moving the release date because we want to have a great film. And if, right. that, if it's going to take a little more extra time to get the great film, then I have no problem with them moving the release date. If they hold to it and make it work, because they did say that a lot of what Lord and Miller shot is usable. And it makes sense because mm -hmm. Ron Howard, and I don't know if people have mentioned this on the show or on a Jedi Council, but Ron Howard is the perfect guy to come in, not just because he's a veteran and all this kind of stuff, but because he understands the comedic style of Lord and Miller having done Arrested Development. Same kind of vibe and how they do some kind of improvisational movements, some movements right to the camera, that kind of comedy. So if most of what they shot is still usable, Ron Howard is the right guy to step in and get this on course and get it out by May 25th, 2000. So there's certainly a chance, but for me personally, I'd rather them take a little bit more time if they need it to get it right. Yeah, yeah and they've recently pushed release dates of movies and it has not bothered me yeah. at all. Nah. I'd actually prefer it to be moved back to December of 2018. We'll have to see what happens, but I don't think this is the last time we're going to be talking about <laughs> no. all of the behind the scenes on the Han Solo movie. And that's never a good thing, especially with Lucasfilm, who likes to keep everything behind closed doors and not do their laundry in public. Yeah. We're doing a lot of laundering this week. <laughs> All right, what's our next story, Ashley? Deadline is reporting that Warner Brothers is mounting a sequel to the 2016 hit The Accountant with screenwriter Bill DeBook, director Gavin O'Connor, and Ben Affleck all in talks to return. The trade notes that as soon as the deals close, all three <clears throat> will then work out the beats of this story, which will likely also include John Bernthal, who played the hitman brother of Affleck's character in the first film. The film grossed a solid $155.1 million worldwide and has found some legs after its home video release. A release date has yet to be determined. Roca, thoughts on a sequel to The Accountant with Ben Affleck returning? Yeah, I absolutely love this idea. Uh, I enjoyed the movie. I went and saw it a couple times in the theaters. It's Goodwill Hunting as an assassin, so it's a nice little connection here with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. So I enjoyed that. I thought Anna Kendrick was great. And you got to see J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons is essentially playing Commissioner Gordon to Ben Affleck's back. It was like a, it was like a dry run of their relationship for what's coming out in Justice League because he kind of covered for Ben Affleck, him being the guy on, side of the, on the side of trying to find out these, trying to break these like mafia people who do these, this money laundering stuff. So I enjoyed that, and I thought Cynthia Di Robinson, who played Amanda Waller in Arrow, was great in the movie as well. So they left the movie in a position where you could have a, le a legitimate sequel, and John Bernthal and, and Ben Affleck's chemistry was fantastic. So And Gavin O'Connor, I've been a, friend, a fan of his since, uh, since Warrior, so I love his stuff, and Bill DeBook did a nice job writing this film. The question comes, what do we do next? And I don't know if you can put a spoiler alert on, but like at the end of the movie... There you go. Yeah, there we go. At the end of the movie... They come together, John Bernthal and Ben Affleck, and you have this idea that they're now together because they found each other again after having lost each other for 10 years. The question is, do they now go forward together or do they end up on opposite sides unknowingly again and we have a rehash of the original movie? So, But either way, I, I'd be excited to see what they would do with it. My only concern is sometimes movies come out like this and they're really great when you see them and they're nice standalone films and when they try to do a sequel that doesn't quite grasp the magic that was bare, that was enough there for people to enjoy it, but maybe not enough for people to keep coming back and go to old, I mean, other installments. Ken, do we need more accounting in our life? <laughs> Look, man, I actually thought November Man was uh, underrated. <laughs> oh, this is it's, a different It's a different franchise. Different picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll get to Pierce later. <laughs> uh, I liked Warrior. Gavin O'Connor, I trust him with this and that. I, I like Affleck in this kind of stuff. It mm -hmm. seems like he's more interested in this than, than maybe being uh, in a cape, and I, I actually understand that. Uh, but I think, John, you made the best point to this idea, which is despite whatever the first movie might have done for a lot of people and they liked it, uh, yeah, it reminds me of Taken? Yeah. You heard of Taken? Mm -hmm. You also heard of Taken 2 and 3 and 7. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think just just, just stop. Just stop. Press the brakes. But, yeah. hey, it's a team, a winning team, and they want to have fun. And, look, at this point, Ben Affleck isn't that – if he wants to do something or doesn't want to do something, that's yeah. what happens, and he's earned that. So go for it. I'm on board if they are all on board. If yeah, the, together. The, the problem with action movies is that there's been – some of my favorite movies of all time are action film sequels. Some of my – least favorite movies, movies that I actually despise, are also action movie sequels yeah. within the yeah. same franchise. Die Hard 2 and 3, I think, are fantastic. 4 and 5, let's yeah. talk about it. But The yeah. Account is a movie that I saw, and I wasn't walking out of that flick clamoring for a sequel because right. I didn't think it was great. I, I enjoyed it okay for what it was, but it wasn't to the level of John Wick for me. So if this is something that Ben Affleck and Gavin O'Connor get together and have this great idea of where they want to take this franchise, it's got to be something new and it's got to be something fresh. You're right, Roka. The risk you run here is it being a rehash of a movie that we've already seen mm -hmm. that 
I thought was a little blah. There just there there wasn't a whole lot of meat in there for me. Part of that is because Ben Affleck's character is so emotionally detached from everything that you really rely on the people around you. And I thought Anna Kendrick and Bernthal yeah, and J.K. Simmons were fine, but I want to see more in this world if we're going to go back to it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want this this smaller story about this guy. We already know he's a known quantity now, so let's have some fun with this. A lot like what John Wick would do with the Continental, mm -hmm. where you get to explore more of that world. Let me see more of this world that we're in, as opposed to just getting to know Ben Affleck's character a little bit more, which I think we pretty much got the bulk of that yeah. the first time. So you're in for an accountant sequel. Yeah, I'm in to go see it. If it gets terrible reviews, okay, but at least they, they I think they deserve a shot. It may more money than probably anticipated in a film like this usually does. So. And you're in for a November Man sequel. Totally. <laughs> yeah. December no. Man. Yeah. The Christmas is coming. <laughs> All right, let's move to opening this week. This is where Ashley is going to tell us one of the many flicks that are in theaters this weekend. What are we going to see, Ash? It's Baby Driver. Talented getaway driver Baby Ansel Elgort relies on the beat of his personal soundtrack to be the best in the game. After meeting the woman, Lily James, of his dreams, he sees a chance to ditch his shady lifestyle and make a clean break. Coerced into working for a crime boss, Kevin Spacey, Baby must face the music as a doomed heist threatens his life, love, and freedom. Raise your hand if you've seen this movie on the panel. Ah, damn it, Roke. All right, why are Ken and I <laughs> getting excited about Baby Drive? Neither one of you have seen it? I went to a Dodger game on Thursday when the screening was. <laughs> Sorry. Look, here's the number one thing I said. I said it on Twitter. I said if we didn't get an Edgar Wright Ant-Man movie cause he could, so he could do this movie, then it was worth it. Woo. Baby Driver is so different than what you'll see in the theaters this entire summer. It's fantastic performances from everyone around, everyone around. It's kind of it kind of goes back to the kind of John Wick vibe a little bit but with a with a, a tighter script, more interesting characters, and these characters, these actors look like they're having a lot of fun all the way through it. You know, John Bernthal is in it again, Jamie Foxx is fantastic, John Hamm. I think this is some of John Hamm's best work since Mad Men on screen. And of course, Kevin Spacey. Whenever Kevin Spacey gets a chance to shine in a film it's always fun to watch this. And this Ansel Elgort kid is fantastic. Carries you through the movie. It's It zigs when it should zag, and it zags when it should zig. And that, to me, makes it a fantastic film. And it's, it's, it's a nonstop joyride from beginning to end. And there's a lot of hardcore stuff that happens, but... You, there's a love story there between him and Lily James. By the way, Lily James, I mean, shout out to this woman who just come out of this Downton Abbey situation and she's just killing it all over the place on screen. Their chemistry is so beautiful and fantastic and pure that it's so much fun to watch. And it, like, it's kind of a romantic comedy inside of this insane uh, uh, action film. I was locked into the trailers. Everybody's been raving about this. Harloff is gushing. I think you yeah. said it's like one of his three favorite movies of the year so far. Yeah. So Baby Driver is something that is definitely on my radar. I think you can actually go see it tonight. I think it's, it gets released on Wednesday, meaning that if you see it like a Tuesday night, midnight, or 10 p.m. situation, have at it. Ken, you look at this soundtrack. I know you're a big oh, music yeah. guy. I know mm -hmm. you're a big soundtrack guy. Yeah. You get everything from T-Rex to Young MC in here. And a great song that you guys need to look up. Hocus Pocus by Focus is on the soundtrack here. You excited for Baby Driver? Uh, I am uh, excited for everyone who's an Edgar Wright fan to go out and experience him at his best and what he loves doing. I, I am a Edgar Wright uh, uh, acquaintance. Uh, I'll say that um, the the last one, the world's uh, world's end, uh, was did not hit me. And I love Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz mm -hmm. is one of my favorite comedies. Uh, as is uh, Shaun of the Dead, I, I, I get the appeal. Um, but uh, I'm glad he left Ant Man to do something like this because again, that's that is some someone doing knowing what he wants to do and knowing who he is. Mm -hmm. And then he's gonna he's gonna service his audience. And and I hope uh, you know I hope everyone gets to enjoy it. Can I push back a little bit and tell you like for people yeah. who feel this way, yeah. I absolutely get it because all of his films were British. But this is a quintessential American movie, and it has quintessential American sensibilities to it. Mm -hmm. So it will it will connect with you, and it will take you through the movie. Trust me on that. Can I push back? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> I love British movies more than American movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'll go watch Transformers Fair. 5. <laughs> it's interesting because when I saw The World's End, I was like, that, that was back when Edgar Wright was still doing Ant Man. And I was watching that movie and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's really funny and I like these guys. And then there's a there's an action sequence, a fight scene that takes place in, in the bathroom oh, of one yeah. of the bars that they're in. And I'm like, 
holy, this guy should be doing Ant. I can't wait to see what he does with that. And now by proxy, Baby Driver, which does feature a lot of action, a lot of car chases. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to see this movie. I am over the moon about it. And judging from the chat room, you guys are as well. Tell us, is Baby Driver your most anticipated of this weekend? You also have The House with Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler. So I have a lot of movies I'm going to try to see in Houston. I'm going to try to see The House. I'm going to try to see Baby Driver. Uh, the Beguiled is something I still oh, want to yeah. see. And uh, All Eyes on Me is something I still need to check out. So a lot of movies coming out this weekend let us know what you guys want to see the most and we will move on to buy or sell this is the part of the show where ashley is going to give us a premise we will say whether we buy it or sell it and then roca and ken push back <laughs> <laughs> in a report from deadline new line and warner brothers are moving forward on the conjuring three hiring conjuring two screenwriter david leslie johnson to pen the script James Wan, who directed the first two films of the franchise, will return as a producer, but will not be directing this time. There is no word yet on who might fill in as a director. Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga are both expected to return as The Conjuring 3 will also be based on another real-life case of paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. No release date has been set at this time. Mark, buy or sell The Conjuring 3. It's a huge buy, Ashley, because we might get werewolves in this movie. Stick with me. Okay, so we're getting a lot of spinoffs from this universe. We got the Annabelles. We're going to have a spinoff of The Nun that we saw in The Conjuring 2. That's its own movie. Make it a Crooked Man movie, also in The Conjuring 2. That's going to be its own movie. Then we have The Conjuring 3, which is going to follow another lesser-known case file of the Warrens. Details are sketchy as to what that's going to be, but one of the things that they investigated, which I have no idea how it actually ended up, was they were, they were researching a case of reports of a werewolf. So maybe it's one of these things where somebody had some weird bath salts or something and they went crazy and they had the, the hair of a Josh Makuga and they just started attacking people at night and that is why they thought it was indeed a werewolf. I don't know what all the backstory is but we're getting back into the supernatural world with the Warrens. It's a big buy for me. Even with James Wan not directing which is somewhat of a panic he's still producing it and James Wan by all accounts thus far in his producing career with his company Atomic Monster has been a hands on producer. He's not somebody who's just going to slap his name on something so he can get some money and let people go off and make a bad movie. James Wan cares about this franchise. I think that's going to continue with The Conjuring 3. Roca, you yeah. buying or selling oh, Conjuring 3? Yeah, I absolutely buy it. I mean, why stop now? I mean, the, the factory is making money. You found two really good actors in Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga to carry you in through these films and anchor the films in some good, fantastic acting and, and uh, connectability. Uh, the last one was made for $40 million and it made $320 million worldwide. So why would you? stop keep pushing this until it runs out of gas it, it's it's the smart move and yes james wan is only back as a producer but i'm sure he'll find the right director that you know keeps going with this atmosphere and the sensibilities of this film that make them so uh so watchable and annabelle creation is getting a gr amazing buzz mm -hmm. so yeah there's no logical reason to stop so i totally buy it can we can make a movie out of literally every warren case file <laughs> all the way down to where they investigate a house and they find out it really is just the air conditioner yeah, and I'll buy I'll buy this for horror fans uh, and, and thriller fans and and ghost fans. It scares me, as we know. But you know, we know the writers of the first two, uh, uh, the Hayes brothers. Yeah, we've had them on on the Schmoes No Show. And, and, and remember that first interview, which Makuga was scared running in the corner. They off. Off uh, a camera told us the amount of stories that she had told them. Mm. We know that this could keep going and going and going. It so is keep creepy. exploring it. It was giving us the heebie-jeebies and chills right when we were there listening in a in a lit studio. So imagine with James Wan behind it uh, as as a producer, uh, he's going to protect this franchise. So buy it, man. Scare all the kids. Now you know where my brain goes. Pay, uh, sometimes I will go to a conspiracy theory level, and my my thinking with this is that the Warrens are actually the ones putting the ghosts there. I think the Warrens show up <laughs> and they and they're like, oh, let's do. Hey, you know what? Fair. You know what, honey? Well, hey, Lorraine, let's do a Wolfman <laughs> in Europe. You want to put a wolf man in there? Awesome. And then they go off and they make a bunch of money. That's my take on the warrants. They put the ghost there in the first place. All right. Ashley, are you buying or selling a Conjuring 3? Uh, I hesitantly buy it, mostly because I love this franchise, so I want to buy it. But <clears throat> the reason I hesitantly buy, buy it is because I feel like James Wan is really, really smart in what he chooses to direct and what he chooses to produce. And every time I feel like he's unsure about a movie, he's like, uh, you know what, I'm going to let someone else take the reins of this one, and I'm just going to be on as a producer. Because when Annabelle came around, I think John R. Leonetti uh, directed the first one, and I was not crazy about the first one, but he came on as a producer, and I know that people are really loving the second Annabelle, so I'm really, really excited. But I wonder if The Nun and The Crooked Man don't do too well, if 
Conjuring 3 will still continue on, or maybe they'll just pump the brakes and say, you know what, I think we're done with this world. But I'm going to buy it because I'm probably just going to see it regardless because I love this universe. Yeah, Wendy, it is kind of like a shared Avengers universe at this point when you have the crooked <laughs> man and you have the creepy <laughs> nun and then you have the Conjuring 3 and maybe they all get back together at an airport. Are you excited for Conjuring 3? Yeah, this is like the James Wan multiverse. Uh, <laughs> I am excited for... Conjuring 3, but I am kind of bummed to see that he's not going to be directing, like Ashley said, that he's just going to be producing. I like what he did with Conjuring 2 and some of the shots that he got and some of the jump scares that I was not expecting to have that scared the crap out of me. So I am a little worried that it may be subpar to the last two, seeing that James Wan won't be directly directing it, but I'm so into the franchise that I'm going to buy it for now. Uh, Ken, are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Because you got a fever of 103. What's our next story? <laughs> SGX Films has released the first trailer for The Foreigner, the action thriller directed by Casino Royale's Martin Campbell that stars Jackie Chan and Pierce Brosnan. Set in London, the film is based on the 1992 novel The China Man, with Chan playing a man who loses his daughter in a bombing and seeks justice against the rogue Irish bombers who took her from him. When an official named Liam Hennessy, Brosnan, reveals evidence that the explosion was the work of a conspiracy, the news sends Chan's special forces agent on a path to revenge. The movie is set for release on September 28th. Ken Byer saw the first trailer from The Foreigner. I will buy it. I made the November Man joke reference along with the accountant. It's got that similar vibe. But again, this is it's it's a weird topic right now. It's terror in London. Uh, it might hit close to home, might hit too close to home. I don't know. But I, I love Casino Royale. I love Martin Campbell's work. I know Green Lantern didn't work out so well for him and a lot of people. And he's been quiet ever since. But uh, also interested in what it uh, presents Jackie Chan as. Uh, we here in American audiences were so used to the Jackie Chan that exploded on a scene, what, 20 years ago now, uh, being all fun and kicks and games. And this one looks very serious. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a Pierce Brosnan fan. I'm a, I'm a Remington Steel fan, man, back in the day. <laughs> so I, I'm excited. I'll, I'll, I will buy this trailer. Yeah, I'm a, it's a big buy for me. I'm a huge fan of aging action stars still kicking ass. I mean, we got to see it with Liam Neeson and Taken or Denzel Washington and The Equalizer. I love these kind of revenge movies. So I love the premise. Watching the trailer, for a little while, I was like, is this a direct to Redbox situation? Mm, it just mm. The way it was cut together just seemed like a little haphazard. But then they gave us a shot of Jackie Chan doing what Jackie Chan does, beating up people as he's falling off a roof. And it looked like one of those classic like Rumble in the Bronx kind of setups. And so if they get a little bit of that action into this movie that also does appear to have a very emotional core to it, I am all in on this movie. I'm buying it too. How about you, Roka? Yeah, absolutely buying this film. I, you know, the thing we love about our action stars is they come in along the time and we really like gravitate to them. We go watch their movies and love their movies. We fall in love with them as characters and the actors as people. And so when they go away for a while, when they get to come back and like explode back onto the scene, when they're doing something like this, you can't help but be excited for it. I, this is a different side of Jackie Chan than American audiences have seen. I mean, that shot of him on the bus near the end of the trailer, that's a that's an older man like who has lived a life and you can see the pain and this and the sadness in his heart and you can just see it and so a lot of action stars don't get to get those kinds of films done we said it's taken absolutely but this one has a feels like it has an even harder edge than taken because she's already dead his daughter yeah. is already dead at the beginning of the trailer so we know that this is going to be a very passionate thing and Pierce Brosnan has got that Irish bro are we going to go Northern Ireland are we going to go the Troubles what are we exploring here you know so there's a lot to unpack from the trailer that gets me excited to see this and you're right there are moments that it feels a little direct that's stx entertainment like they're not high end necessarily so the, some of the stuff's going to look a little direct to dvd but i don't think it takes away the power of the trailer itself so i absolutely buy it i mean we martin campbell is a hit or miss director like ken mentioned but he's due for a hit because the last one was a miss so i buy into this in casino royale some of that action especially those first few minutes in the yeah. black and white that's some hardcore action, and it looks like that's the kind of stuff that's going to happen here in this film. If you were to have a fight between everybody who's a movie star who also has an AARP card, I think that Jackie Chan <laughs> would be at the top of the list, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, much more. Like, like Liam Neeson, he's great in Taken, but the, he, he's not a great runner. Jackie Chan still <laughs> seems very athletic. Denzel yeah. Washington, I think he'd give him a run for his money, but Chan Roke, yeah. I got to think he's the favorite. Him or, or uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, I mean, he's kind of long in the tooth himself. So yeah, Van him, Damme's pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean... 
I love Van Damme. All right, well, that's not actually the only trailer you guys can check out. If you guys want to go to Collider Video's YouTube page, hey, that's what you're watching right now. We have a new trailer for a sketch called Blue Apron, the movie. It's up right now. You guys can catch that on the Collider Video channel, or you can watch it on Jeremy Johns' show, Awesome Tacular, on the Go90 Network. It, a new episode drops every Friday, so make sure you guys check that out. Speaking of other stuff coming out, an all-new Collider Heroes is going to be live today. 1 p.m. is when Collider Heroes airs, and we had an episode of TV Talk yesterday, so check that out on our channel as well. Plus, an all-new episode of the Team League of the Movie Trivia Schmodown is about to debut. Here's a quick promo. Six degrees and tough beats competing today. It's a loser leaves town match. The winning team gets to stay together. The losers have to break up and move to opposite ends of the earth. Make sure you guys check that out. At the end of the show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. Ask something different. Ask something fresh. Ask something original. And on that note, we have our mailbag that we go to occasionally here on Movie Talk. And we have our weekend shows mailbag where it's all of your questions. You can email us anytime. Collider Video at gmail.com. So ask something that you don't think anybody has ever asked before in the world of movies. Maybe you can get a little personal, like, hey, Ken, what's your favorite restaurant that's a corporate chain? <laughs> There's a lot to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get an answer to you at the end. We'll get back to you. Maybe that's a mailbag weekend show kind of question. In the meantime, Ashley has something else cooking. What's in the mailbox? <laughs> Tom writes, question. I saw Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, and found it very enjoyable, but I'm confused by the negative response. The main complaints by people seem to be the incoherent story and how it is far-fetched. However, the Fast and Furious franchise have the same issues, but in general are received with positive reviews. Why is it that Fast and Furious gets a pass from people and the Pirates film are torn apart. Uh, I okay. The Fast and Furious movies. It, it just there, there seems to be a word that some people don't like using when they're talking about an official movie review, and that word is fun. I did. I have more fun watching the Fast and Furious movies recently than I have had watching the Pirates movie. For whatever reason, the Pirates movies to me feel a little more forced, a little more laborious, if that's the right word, whereas the Fast and Furious movies, you know exactly what you're getting. You get what you pay for, and they're not trying to put any wool over your eyes and say, oh, no, this is something we take very seriously. They know it's ridiculous. They know it's stupid popcorn action, and that's what I'm paying for. With Pirates of the Caribbean, I got a lot of fun adventure with the first one, and it just seems like the ones since then have not been able to get that movie magic back. So we might be holding pirates to a higher standard. It's a fair question to ask because sometimes we go in as an audience and we just want to see something stupid. And other times we're going to hold such this high. Like if I go see a Star Wars movie and it ends up being a Fast and Furious movie, I'm going to leave pissed off. But I just know what to expect with a Fast and Furious flick more so than with a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Ken, how do you see it? Yeah, you know, it's it's a simple answer on one hand. Uh, in other, it's also very complicated. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of people rooting against Johnny Depp right now. Mm. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't want to see him succeed. A lot mm -hmm. of people think it's tired. A lot of people think it's just big budget bloatedness. Uh, Fast and Furious, let's not forget, was off the radar screen. It was straight to the DVD rack. You could buy it at a gas station in a bin for $5. They changed it. They, they adapted. It seems fun and fresh with a great diverse cast. Hits a lot of little, uh, little uh, check mark marks for a lot of people who want to have fun movie experiences where this <laughs> Pirates does it. But at the same time, Tom... Like what you like. One of my favorite comedies of all time is the Norm MacDonald masterpiece Dirty Work. Yeah. Oh, God. And it's a horrible oh movie. God. But I love it. As John Roca could tell you, sometimes you just like movies that the world hates. That's true. And that's okay, too. That's the big secret about this industry that we're in as pundits. It's we're going to wag our fingers and say this movie didn't work. But you know what? If you out there liked it, 
That's all you need to know. Mm-hmm. Street fighting man, G7. <laughs> what you got, Roka? Yeah, I agree with you completely. I think it's a matter of the Fast and Furious movies are just fun movies, and they've adapted what you said, Ken, is correct. They've brought in other actors. They've, they've given those actors legitimate storylines and things to play. They bring strong characters into this franchise. Keep it going. The Rock. St- the second The Rock stepped in, this franchise found new life, pushed aside uh, Vin Diesel a little bit, and it made it work. Johnny Depp has been unable to do that. In fact, he was the one that said he didn't want a female villain in this. Like, he he is, at times, puts his fingerprints a little too hard on this and never cedes the spotlight as the lead in this in these franchises, and that can be a problem. Orlando Bloom was basically decoration in this film. Kira Knightley has two scenes, and the, the kids are great that they bring in. I actually enjoyed this Pirates movie, but... Once again, my bar isn't high for this. So it's just, am I going to enjoy myself? Yes. Is he great as Jack Sparrow? Absolutely. But you need to breathe new life into this. And you're also dealing with ships. With Fast and Furious, you're dealing with cars. And that's a whole other ball game. You're not going, oh, what's that ship? What's, no, with all the different cars you can play in just one scene, you have seven different cars of different brands, different makes, different styles, and they're all cool to look at and fun to play around with. And the different scenarios. You're just on the water or land. Whereas in Fast and Furious, you're on different countries. You're on an iceberg. Different tracks. Yeah. yeah, iceberg. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going almost, to space next. Yeah, we're space. Oh, yeah, of so course. Close, man. Submarine. That's a submarine behind that <laughs> exactly. head. Come on. Come on. I, I, I go back to what Ken said. It's just, it, it feels, sometimes these Pirates movies just feel like work. And look, yeah. it, it, like if I was to rate the most recent Pirates movie versus the most recent Fast and the Furious movie, I think they're probably like on my, on the Schmoe's rating system of zero to five, I think it's like a point. Five difference at the most. Mm-hmm. So my enjoyment level is about the same here. I just have a little bit more fun with the fate of the furious, I guess. All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. We love these. Wendy, let's get a good one. All right, the first one, I'm going to start you guys off easy, is from Jay Miller, who writes, why do people bash Sony so much? They've put out a lot of great movies. Just look at their filmography. I think it's very easy to bash Sony right now because they they had the horrible email leak that happened, so you get to see the inner workings of a studio, which nobody should ever be privy to, so you can judge somebody based on this email you read, but you really don't get the bigger scope of it, and you also have no comparison when it's Sony versus how another studio may operate, so I don't really hold their feet to the fire in that. I think that Sony's had a couple high-profile misses recently. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is something... It's hard to mess up a Spider-Man movie, and they did it pretty gloriously because they just tried to cram too much stuff in there, and it just felt like a sloppy mess. I enjoyed Amazing Spider-Man mm-hmm. 2 for the most part, but I can understand why a lot of people push back against it. And then Ghostbusters is a movie that I also enjoyed, but it just... The marketing campaign was flawed. The trailers did not sell the movie appropriately, in my opinion. It, it kind of made us that, wait, is this still the same universe? So there was a lot of issues with some of their marketing as much as the actual film content itself. So... I, I think that Sony has a couple high-profile black eyes, perhaps, Roka. Yeah. Do you see it as being a more of an integral problem with that studio? It could be. I, I think it, it. sometimes, you know, every studio has bad mistakes. Every studio takes makes effort in, in, towards uh, sequels, and it doesn't quite work out. This, all of them have it. No one's clean. Do you know what I'm saying? But Sony is getting a increasingly a badder and badder rap a, as it goes forward. So to me, there may be something they, they might want to take a look at and look at what What's happening because the end product is not matching the work that they're putting into creating these uh, situations. So, or it may be the the choices that they're making of the films that they're putting their creative talents behind. Because sometimes it can be a, the wrong mix, the wrong franchise with the wrong studio producing. We've seen that with Fantastic Four twice now. So it's just a matter of like, are they finding the right material that serves their style, their way of approaching films? Ken, this is the studio that is going to bless us with the, uh, the Smurfs, The Lost Village, and the upcoming The Emoji Movie. Your thoughts on Sony? Well, I was going to say nice things about them, but then you said those two movies. <laughs> I think it's, uh, like I said, I think a big thing is the leaks. And it just becomes, yeah. things become public uh, pop culture zeitgeist punching bag and, and punchlines. And that's sometimes what happened. And then you mentioned some of the movies they struggle with. Um, it's, we're all schoolyard bullies, man. In 1983, I had a Return of the Jedi t-shirt on, and I was uh, choked and pushed down for that. So my reputation for the next six years was the nerdy Star Wars kid, and I couldn't shake it. Sony can't shake something that happened, uh, the email leak or the bad movies. But, you know, we said that about DC recently, and then they gave us a wonderful movie to change what they, yeah. or their perception was. Yeah, and it seems like every time they try to climb out, they see that there's that interview with Amy Pascal and Kevin Feige that puts it, oh, boy, yeah. it puts it all back down again. And you're just like, ah, 
you just want him to get a shot, like just a yeah. little bit of a break for a while. They had know? a better interview with uh, with Collider over the week. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. our, our man Frosty yeah. talked to both at the same time, and it seemed like they were more on the same page. It was almost like yeah. he was interviewing Pascal because he was curious about what they're doing with Venom and <laughs> yeah. all that other stuff. So what are you doing? It was, it's, I, I think it's getting better. And this is also, yes, they're giving us the Emoji movie, but they're also giving us a Spider-Man movie mm. that I'm pretty excited about seeing tomorrow night. A lot of that is with the MCU, too. You also have Baby Driver is a Sony movie, True. and you have The Dark Tower on August 4th. So really, really hope that's a good one. All right, Wendy, what's up next? TJ Dext writes, over or under, oh, uh, sorry, wow. Over <laughs> or under 30%, you hear Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise in a trailer before a September 8th opening. Oh, boy. So we'll probably get one more big trailer for it. And it's a tough, over or under 30%. I, I don't think here's okay. I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think you're gonna hear Pennywise in a trailer, mm. but I think that it's over thirty percent. So I'll, I'd put it at like forty percent. How about you, Rob? <laughs> yeah, I say over because a lot of people aren't that familiar. This is a whole new generation, right? It, it, so a, a lot of people aren't that familiar with this character. If you want to bring him in, I think you have one line, just one line, either in blackness or or, or voiceover, and let that be you to decide if that's the voice or not, but I, I think we're going to absolutely hear a voice. Ken, you've, you've dealt with creepy clowns in your past. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to hear him talk in a trailer? Uh, n no. I, 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 if, if it is, it's going to be the way John said it is, but I th I'll take the under and, you know, let it, let it, let it hit full impact in the theater. Mm. Wendy, do you think we should hear Pennywise the Clown speak? I, I would prefer to not see it in a trailer. Right. I well, prefer to hear his voice in the theater for the first time. Oh, I see. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to hear it at all. I want it to be a surprise, like when I'm sitting in the theater and then be completely creeped out and then I won't be able to sleep with the lights off for months. But <laughs> I have this sinking feeling that they're going to do it. They're going to show it to us in the trailer. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to be the biggest, you know, the spoiler of the year if I hear what the clown sounds like in a trailer. But it'd be nice to keep that surprise hidden for a couple more months. All right, let's do another one. Okay, this one comes from Alan Reed, who writes, if the Joker were to have the Infinity Gauntlet, what do you think he'd do with it? If the Joker were to have the Infinity Gauntlet, <laughs> he would do the one thing that the Joker always loves doing, or any Batman villain loves doing for that matter, change the weather. Every villain, at some point in their career, wants to change the weather. If it's snowing, they want to make it sunny. If it's sunny, they want to make it snowing. I think the Joker is actually somebody I would trust with the Infinity Gauntlet more than a lot of other villains. Because the Joker, mm. yes, he's, he's completely crazy and deranged, but he, I don't think he wants to murder everybody. I don't think the Joker wants to do that. I think he wants to torture Batman for sure and maybe kill a lot of Batman's loved ones, the ones that are still alive. But I think I'm going to be fine if the Joker gets the Infinity Gauntlet. So I would rather have the Joker with the Infinity Gauntlet than Thanos. How about that? Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> what about you, Ken? Well, if it's, if it's Ledger's Joker, he's going to introduce a little chaos into the galaxy. Mm -hmm. He's going to use that. If it's Nicholson's Joker, he's going to throw a damn great party. Do, 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 do. Ha! And then if it's, <laughs> if it's Leto's Joker, he's just going to use it to stand, send uh, dead rats to uh, his enemies. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, so I'm not worried about... Uh, I'm not worried about Nicholson's Joker. I, actually, I would welcome. If I had the Infinity Gauntlet, I would willingly hand it over to Jack's Joker um, or <laughs> Cesar Romero's Joker, for that matter. Uh, yes. I would keep it away from Heath Ledger's Joker. I don't think I'd be too upset if Jared Leto's Joker got mm. it. Um, and maybe he got that uh, from Ashley before she uh, kicked him to the curb. So, <laughs> Roca. <laughs> Do you think Joker and the Infinity Gauntlet is that dangerous? Yeah, I mean, if you give, I think the first thing he'd do is time. Because if there's anything a comedian enjoys, it's going back and listening to his best jokes and then going slow motion and watching people react to them. So if he could mess with Batman, he would relive his greatest con conquests over Batman. So all that kind of stuff and then turning people in a certain way and enjoy the slow motion change as he squeezes, as the, uh, uh, whatever, he puts the gas over their face and their smile appears. Like there's all my, I think he would do the time thing. Number one thing he would do is go back and do the best he could do and time and go forward and see if he's still alive and then who he could mess with in the future. Uh, it would just be chaos. When I'm on the road this weekend at the Houston Improv, I'm just going to have a camera on the audience so I can <laughs> slow motion watch them. <laughs> you got a lot to learn about comedy. Buddy. Oh, there uh, it is. Let's do one more Twitter question, Wendy. All right, this one comes from J.L. Phillips <laughs> the second, who writes, if you could photobomb a scene in a movie, what movie and scene would you pick? <laughs> I love this question. I feel like Roca is going to put himself in a Transformer No, movie. no. 
I'm very there's enough going on there. I'm very anti photo bombing on the whole though. I don't I never I never find it funny. I've never yeah. done it. I I there, the there, there's some other people around the office who uh -huh. shall remain nameless uh -huh. who enjoy photo bombing yeah. and I just don't I I can't stand it. it it's yeah. one of my it's officially one of my pet peeves. So if I could yeah. photo bomb any scene Ah, uh, man, I'm, I'm taking Star Wars off the table. Mm -hmm. um, I'm taking Jaws off the table. I'm going through my favorite movies. I think I would have to photobomb something in Back to the Future. Oh, I think something okay. in Back to the Future. It's just, it's too great of a movie. Maybe I could be up there with Marvin Barry and his band and just like be mm. like, like, you know, slapping some bass in the background. But uh, I think I'd probably photobomb Back to the Future. How about you, Ken? Uh, I would photobomb the Beatles curling and help. <laughs> 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 so you would be behind the Beatles, yeah, and you would just be like a producer, yeah, just back there, like, yep, just photo bumping them. Uh, just, okay, yeah. wow, got the Beatles, got Back to the Future. We both want to be in rock bands. Apparently, clearly. yeah, I, I want to. I'll photo bomb the Godfather uh, in the uh, uh, wedding scene when they all get together to take the picture. Oh, I would like to dive one. in the back and be like. You know, like, hey, <laughs> Corleone. Of course, I'd be dead within the day, yeah. but it would be worth it. It'd be worth it. But I like your Back to the Future. You could fade in and out. You could be part of the plot because people could see you fading in that's and out depending on Marty is, gets to well, do like things you photo not. bomb. And actually, that's what I hope happens to anybody who ever photo bombs one of my pictures. Yeah. I hope they slowly <laughs> fade out and disappear <laughs> from the face of the earth. Ashley, when do you guys ever photo bomb? Uh, I, I never photobomb. I think it is so, so rude. But if I had to pick a movie to photobomb, I want to see Mean Girls just so I could be on the set. Oh, but I don't oh, want to ruin nice. the movie because it's so perfect. I have photobomb before just because the one person that I've done it to have done it to me. So uh, I do yeah, it right back for the them. Like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think I want to photobomb in like a monster movie, like a kaiju, like, or behind like Jaws. Mm. Just pop out <laughs> behind the shark. I like that. I'd like to photobomb the notebook, actually. Now, now that I think about it, when they kiss in the rain, I just want to be back around the cliff. Like. <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for us here at Collider <laughs> Movie Talk. I thank all you guys for joining us. Please leave a comment and hit that like button. Thank you to everybody behind the scenes. Joey and Cody keeping us live and running here today. And the panel up here with me, Mr. Ken Knapsack. Where can the kids find you? Hey, you can find me at Ken Knapsack across all social media platforms. My voice will recover from yelling at the wrestling program last night that we all got to attend <laughs> thanks to see Geek out there uh, yeah, great time too bad you weren't there mark too bad i was not there for fake sports roca <laughs> oh you guys can always find me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram the cinephiles on uh, itunes and stitcher and youtube and of course the outlaw nation podcast on the sk plus podcast channel Wrestling's fine. I'm glad you're getting enjoyment out of life. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And Wendy Lee Zaney. I'll be photobombing on the Movie Couple channel <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube <laughs> and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. It happens every weekend. I'm on the road. There's going to be a few photobombs taking place at the mm -hmm. Houston Improv this week. It'll be there Thursday through Sunday. You can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. And the Schmoes know, all new show Wednesday night. Neil Blomkamp is going to be calling in, so we get to chat with him. Wow. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Hey, guys. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.